I solo traveled to Iraq in December 2021 as an American. If I'm being fully honest, I was a little bit scared to go on this journey. This was one of the first countries that I went to that was considered dangerous, but what I found there was something that I would have never expected. Not only are people super kind, but they're so welcoming. Although I went on this journey alone, I met so many local people the entire time who constantly helped me out and wanted to show me their country in a beautiful light. I am excited to share this journey with you because I think a lot of people have a different idea of what Iraq is in their heads than what the reality is. Especially because of the fact that I am American, we have a very difficult and tumultuous history with Iraq. Sadly, this is not filmed horizontally, it's filmed vertically because this was way before I was doing YouTube. I think what you might find in this video may surprise you. I'm looking forward to sharing my perspective, not just as a solo woman traveling, but also as an American. So let's get into it. I was finally on my way to Baghdad. All of the flights leaving from Istanbul leave very late. So we flew by night and I tried to get some sleep, but I was too excited. As I started to see the lights of Iraq before we landed, I had no idea what to expect. Once I landed and arrived, I looked for where the visa on arrival station was. I couldn't help but look around and realize that there was a lot of gold, a lot of brightness, and it almost reminded me of Dubai in a way. I don't know why. Everyone went into this room. This was the visa office. Visa on arrival for American passports is $75 total. You need to have exact change. I got my visa. I was so happy to receive it. And now it was time to look for a taxi. Get out of the airport, first you have to take one of these vans. I happened to see a few other foreigners and one woman took it upon herself. <laughs> to be our negotiator. She was a journalist, so she had been here a few times. I wasn't gonna say no because it was 3 a.m. Now I did make it in another taxi. However, my hotel did not have my reservation. So I ended up going a few streets over to the Coral Palace and they had availability. I was a bit annoyed because I did have a reservation and this one was more expensive, but whatever, I just needed to get into the hotel room. It was like 4.30 in the morning. I am so freaking happy to be in this room, you don't even know. And I felt so bad because I tried to tip the guy that helped me with my luggage and he wouldn't even let me tip him. So it's been a long night. This was $150 per night, but it was very nice. It is considered a five-star hotel. When I tell you that I passed out, wow, I really passed out. I woke up in the morning refreshed and ready for the day. This was my outfit. I had no idea what to expect. So I had this dress on, but I also threw a headscarf kind of around my neck just in case I needed it. Lucky for me, they offered breakfast at the hotel. And maybe this looks basic to you, but I love this cheese. I love olives and I love this bread. And of course the shy. My friend Zaid from Couchsurfing picked me up and as we drove through Baghdad, I couldn't help but be amazed as we passed by this square known as Tahrir Square or Liberation Square. There was actually some police presence because there were protests going on, but that was unrelated. All of this footage from my trip to Iraq was in December 2021. So you may have seen shorts from my trip on other platforms, but this is the first time that I'm doing a long form to show you my entire trip. So please keep that in mind. Our first stop was to park the car and actually get on this ferry to take us across this river. This is the Tigris River. It's a very well-known river, sadly because of some conflicts, but also just because it's been mentioned in the Bible and other books. We got onto the boat and although I haven't shown Zaid yet, it was mainly just because I didn't know if he was comfortable being on film, but we slowly were talking more and becoming friends. And he was so kind to show me around today. I really enjoyed this boat ride, even though the weather wasn't that great. At least it was not super hot. Once we got off of the ferry, we needed to make our way to Muntanabi Street. Although it looks like it's a bit in shambles, that's not the case. They were actually doing a lot of construction on these roads at this time, and at this point I assume that most of it has been completed. We should also talk about how in 2003, Iraq was bombed many times by the United States, and the country is still recovering from this. So if you can see, along this road here, all of this has already been redone, so this is what the other areas will eventually look like on the ground. Additionally, all of these buildings have been restored. I looked around and just examined the daily life of everyday Iraqis living in Baghdad. <laughs> Now, this is a lovely historical area, but we were actually heading to Souk al Sasafir. This is the copper market. It's very well known for being a bustling historical copper market, but we weren't quite there yet. First, we needed to wind and walk through this whole area of all of these different vendors. There was food, there was fruit, and I was not complaining because I love markets. <laughs> The 
This souk was established in the Abbasid period, which began in the year 750. But the current market is set to date back to 1600 during the Ottoman period. So this is the copper market. Traditionally, the souk had craftsmen that were specialized in creating handmade copper for household or decorative uses. They were made using hammers and hand tools. Despite the significant role that this souk has played throughout the years, once the U.S. invaded in 2003, the souk began to suffer greatly. I was told that many of the items are now from China, and it used to be filled to the brim with items. But don't worry, because there are still some here. Which is right when I stumbled upon this man. Classic hammering sounds could be heard from a mile around. It was beautiful to watch these incredible craftsmen work. This was actually a family business, as were many of the craftsmen still working here today. This was a father and his son. I'm not sure if he was teaching him or if he was just there to help out, but it was beautiful to see a family still thriving in their original craft continued on and I saw this old man. He looked very sweet. I kept walking, but I would come back to him in a little bit. I saw this incredible store and I had to go in. There were so many items. Since 1918, and uh, we see the signature of, uh, of the Great British. He's basically showing me the certificate to prove how old their shop is and that it's actually antique. Because there was a British invasion, they went through and they gave all the shop owners legal papers that they had established businesses. We see here, 1918, 20 Mars, 1918. Where are you from? Aha, the age old question, where are you from? This was in 2021, I wasn't quite sure how to respond yet. I felt a little nervous to say I was American because I had preconceived ideas on what Iraqis might think about Americans. But I'll get to that in a bit. Now I told you we'd come back to this cute old man. I did end up getting a certified antique. This is what I ended up buying and I'm not totally sure what it is. And again, this was 2021 so I was a little bit shy to ask. But I believe it's where a candle goes in or a scroll. But I was told it's very old and I absolutely love these inscriptions on it so that's why I got it. I didn't want to negotiate too much, so I ended up spending about $30 for it. And Zaid was so mad because he said that I should have let him negotiate because I got a little bit ripped off. But that's okay, I want to contribute to the local economy. Now, sadly, when I was in Iraq, the National Iraqi Museum was closed, and I've heard it's amazing. So we decided to go to this live museum, which kind of showcases history of the indigenous people of Iraq and how people used to live and how they live now. Once you get into the actual museum, you'll see these wax figures, and although they're not super lifelike, it does give kind of a nice idea to understand what people wore, some of the customs that they behaved in, and also how some of these customs translate to some of the things that people still do today. I had yet to realize, but a lot of the things that I'm seeing here I will actually see in the country of Iraq, including a lot of the buildings and how they're set up. Once we left the museum, we headed somewhere kind of interesting. We headed to the oldest known university in the entire world, the Al Mustan Siria University. It's a public university that traces its origins back to 1227. That makes it almost 800 years old. It was modernized in 1963. We came across this carpet shop, and I couldn't believe how beautiful and bright the colors were. And although I've seen this in other countries, it's not as common in Iraq. But it was right about that time to get some lunch. Now, if you know my content, you'll know that I do not eat meat anymore. But at this point, I was still eating some chicken at some points in certain countries. So we went to get some shawarma. Here they sold lamb and chicken shawarma. And I do love a good chicken shawarma. But now I just choose not to eat it because I don't want to eat chicken. But if you're going to eat chicken shawarma, you should eat it here. Because this was so, so good. This is a sweet lemon. <laughs> After we ate, obviously we needed to find some tea, so we walked through the streets of Baghdad. I looked to my left and I saw some destruction. Apparently, this was still from the US occupation. We came to this very well known and old tea shop. However, there were so many people in here, we could not even find a seat, sadly. I also noticed that it was all men. But no worries, you can find tea literally anywhere, and we stopped on the side of the road and had some tea. Now immediately after I had some tea, I also saw fresh pomegranate juice, so I had to get one. It was so sweet and so yummy. But it was about that time to go back across the Tigris River, so we jumped in the boat and we found our car. 
Funny enough, the American station was playing. Now, at the time that I went to Iraq, I was not filming anything for YouTube, and I was on Instagram, but I was not on TikTok at all, so I don't have a ton of content. Here are some of the photos that I took with my phone, just kind of taking in the sights and sounds of Baghdad. I feel like that because of all of the wars and the occupation, a lot of us have this idea of Iraq that it's some society of people that are super angry and hateful for some reason, when that is not the case. And in fact, that leads me to my next location. A place built for the martyrs who died in the Iraq and Iran war, known as the Al-Shahid Monument. It was designed by Ismail Fatah al-Turk under the ruling of Saddam Hussein in 1983. It is 40 meters tall and made with glazed turquoise ceramic tile. The whole site has a park, a playground, parking lots, walkways, bridges, and a lake as well. But when you walk up to this monument, it just feels extremely grand. And it's also very well known in Iraq. I was able to get some good pictures here until I saw a group of men behind me. It was very odd because they did not let us go into the area and they forced us to basically clear the area. I later found out that this was a group of men who were diplomats from Turkey, so they wanted to keep them safe, I guess. Now the day was not over yet. I had one location that I really wanted to go to just for the beauty of it. And it's this beautiful cafe. Altarachi Cafe. It was built in an old style, but it's relatively new. I'm not even sure where I found this, but I saw a photo of it and I really wanted to come. Upon arrival, it kind of looks like an old palace with a bunch of different rooms that all have ornate decorations. I felt like I had basically been eating the entire day, so I was just gonna get something small here. But let's be real, I was here for the photos. I don't know what these are called, but they are filled with dates and they are so tasty. We got some coffee and we just chilled here and relaxed and enjoyed the beauty of this cafe. If you want to go somewhere with a beautiful backdrop just to relax, then I recommend this place. If I'm being completely honest, I only decided to spend a week in Iraq. Again, this was 2021. I was a little bit nervous. This was probably the first country that would be considered a conflict country that I had been to, and I really did not know what to expect. As I stepped through this journey of visiting this country, I realized how wrong I was to make that assumption. But sadly, it meant that I was rushing through, so I had one more final stop for the day. This is the Al Jawadain Holy Shrine. What I'm wearing is called a chador. It is the first time that I ever wore one, and is more commonly worn in black, but I borrowed this from Zaid's sister. In order to enter the mosque and this whole holy area, you have to get through many checkpoints. I didn't film any of them, but don't worry, I'll take you on a journey through all of the checkpoints at a different shrine that I go to. Just like that, I was back at my hotel, finally. I'm so tired because... Woke up at 5.30 because jet lag, but I also went to bed at 7 p.m. <laughs> Today is a very special day. I put on a red dress because I am going to one of the wonders of the world. Time to go to Babylon. I went to the hotel breakfast, of course. I had some baklava, some cheese, olives, and cucumbers. It was amazing. And Zaid picked me up. He told me that this is called an Iraqi drive through because you sit here and you wait for your coffee and then they bring it to your car. One of Zaid's friends came today and he happens to be a historian, so he put on some YouTube videos to educate me really quick. And so different peoples passed through the region. The city received many religious, social, and cultural It was mainly about the myth of Gilgamesh, and as we passed through many different checkpoints, I learned a lot. After about an hour and a half of driving, we came to the outer walls of Babylon. Believe me, I was excited. Funny enough, if you've seen these Ishtar gates, you might know or not know that these are not the original gates. Saddam Hussein actually created these and constructed these because the original gates had been taken from Iraq and they've been put in a museum. I would say this is probably the only touristy place in Iraq. They have paintings showing you what it used to look like. This is a depiction of what the Tower of Babel would have looked like and how it looks in different stories around the world that have been told for centuries. There's also a small museum on site, which is really cool because you can see different artifacts. And a lot of these are in incredible condition. There were also people working here that actually spoke English and told us about a lot of the different information. Now, this is a real piece of the Babylonian wall, the Ishtar gates that have been here for thousands of years. Obviously it is behind glass, but you can see how beautiful and vibrant these colors still are and how it would have actually been that blue, similar to the color of the fake one that Saddam Hussein constructed. I'm so sorry, my quality is so bad. This was years ago and I didn't think that I would be putting it on YouTube, but you get an idea of how beautiful it is. The actual gate is in Germany and the rest of the pieces of the walls are in the UK, US, etc. Many people believe that they are stolen and that they should be returned to Iraq. So these are the walls of an ancient city, so you can imagine how vast this is. All of this was actually restored during the rule of Saddam Hussein. So although it is restored, the foundation is original. 
Babylon was thought to be founded around 2300 BC by the ancient Akkadian-speaking people of southern Mesopotamia. Under the king Hammurabi, ruled from 1792 to 1750 BC, Babylon became a major military power. Here you can see the original foundation. What is incredible about these bricks is that they were made using a mix of reeds and mud, which were made into bricks, and then they used the sun as a kiln almost to basically bake these bricks. It is incredibly advanced for being from so many thousands of years ago. This specific road is thought to be from 1200 BCE, and I am stepping on it. So mind-blowing. As we walked over to a different section, you could still see the remainder of different parts of the original gates of Babylon. The bricks have alternating rows of dragons, bulls, and lions, which symbolize the gods Marduk, Adad, and Ishtar. As we continued on, I could see a palace in the distance. I was told that this was the summer palace of Saddam Hussein. More on that in a bit. Okay, now I know this is only one lion, but this is considered the last lion of Babylon. All others were stolen and put into museums around the world. Behind me is the kingdom, and now we are walking to one of Saddam's palaces. However, although I could see it in the distance, it was not that close yet. There was still quite a far way to get through within the kingdom of Babylon before we could get up to that hill. All of this is some of the unrestored parts. There is one section that Saddam decided to completely restore. Sadly, he did it a little bit sloppily and there's a little surprise in there as well. Now from here, it looks pretty nice. It's very uniform and it is thought to be in the exact same shape as what was here before in the ancient style. Now I didn't mention this before, but when you get to Babylon, there is a local guide who speaks English and you are basically kind of forced to hire the local guide, but for us it was great because we could learn. He began pointing to something, and basically it was an inscription on a piece of brick that was built into the wall. The inscriptions read, In the reign of the victorious Saddam Hussein, the president of the republic, may God keep him the guardian of the great Iraq, the renovator of its renaissance, and the builder of its great civilization. The rebuilding of the great city of Babylon was done in 1987. And now, apparently the reason that he did this was that he had heard that the king Nebuchadnezzar had stamped the bricks of the ancient Babylon with his name and titles. So then he placed these all around and within the Babylonian walls. Egotistical much? After a little bit more walking, we finally came to the palace. I could kind of understand why he built it here above the kingdom of Babylon because it was an incredible view and basically super iconic view. But I couldn't help and think about all of the horrific things that he had probably done here. I would say that some Iraqis do support Saddam Hussein and still continue to support him today, but I think it's impossible not to be aware of how many people he took the lives of and the horrible things that he was known to have done. Having said that, we can admire what a beautiful building this is. The detail is absolutely incredible, but I also liked that it had been defaced because it meant that people were kind of sticking it to him once he was taken down. I do want to quickly state that I was pretty young during the invasion of Iraq, and I wasn't even alive for most of Saddam's rule, so I don't really feel that I can accurately discuss the politics involved with this. All I can do is show you some of these ornate details and give you some of the backstory that I learned and the opinions that I learned from Iraqis while I was in the country. It was a little bit creepy walking around here, but I thought it was really cool to see how a lot of things had not even been touched or really moved. There was definitely a lot of rubbish in the way. You could see how big this house actually was, but this was blocking it, and I was a little bit too chicken to go up. Now I'm kind of regretting that choice though. And this is only one of his palaces. He had tons of palaces all over the country. There was a humongous wood sculpture on the wall. I have no idea what it is. And seeing this chandelier just kind of demolished and decaying after time was so cool. This could be considered dark tourism because it was the house of what is known to be an evil dictator. But I think it also kind of symbolizes the resistance and how Iraq is evolving and overcoming all of the history and the horrible things that have happened. I really loved this mural. I know that's a weird thing to say about a dictator's palace, but you could see all different aspects from around the country of Iraq, so I thought it was a very cool mural that we can now appreciate. All of a sudden, I saw this secret passageway. It goes through. I felt nervous, but I decided to go in anyway. I was in awe. How bizarre that he had all these secret tunnels all through the walls. Whoa. That's crazy. It makes even more crazy, somebody was blasting music. 
Over the next period of time, I was trying to find all of these different passageways. Some of them led to nothing, and some of them were kind of collapsed. But it gave me the idea that there were probably a lot of things about this place that we had no idea about. Let's go outside. At this point, Zaid said, let me take some photos of you. So I did a little mini photo shoot. Please ignore my posing. I feel super cringe about this. But it was 2021, okay? I could only imagine the parties that he once had here. I believe he was known for having pretty crazy parties. And I was told from someone who actually had their father who worked with him that before he went crazy and began murdering literally everyone, he was more reasonable than we might think. Now, I have no idea if this is true or not, but it just means that there were people that were somewhat close to him, and then when he went crazy, a lot of them fled the country because they didn't want to be associated with that. This is the Tower of Babylon. The Tower of Babel has been mentioned in many myths for hundreds of years. What's left of it anyway? Specifically in the book of Genesis in the Old Testament. It is said that all people used to speak the same language. They decided to build a large tower to reach the heavens. So in order for them to not succeed, the Bible states that God forced them all to speak a different language. And this is how all of the languages formed. Now, if you are religious and you believe this, or even if you're not religious, modern scholars have associated the Tower of Babel with certain known structures, such as Etemenanki, which was a ziggurat dedicated to the Mesopotamian god Marduk in Babylon. So this probably is the Tower of Babylon, or at least something nearby, in whatever story or myth that you believe it to be. One part about traveling in countries where there are not really any other tourists is that you can basically do whatever you want, within reason. There's no lines for anything, you can climb wherever you want, there's a sense of freedom and calmness wherever you go. And with that, it was time for us to go. Because we had one more stop. We said goodbye to the Tower of Babel, and I quickly got dressed. Again, I borrowed something from Zaid's sister. This time, I would not be in white, I would be in black, so I would blend in a little bit more. But first, food. Again, this was when I was eating chicken still, so we had this amazing spread. Today, I am taking you inside a shrine, a mosque. But the last time I went into a mosque, I was not able to truly take you through the process because I just didn't film it. This time, it will be different. With every one of these mosques or shrines, there is a very long period of walking where they do not allow cars into. This is out of safety because there has been a lot of incidences in the very far past of bombings associated with being near mosques. So to protect everyone involved, they have a lot of different security checkpoints, and they also do not allow cars to get within a certain amount of distance of the mosque. There is also a lot of police presence just to make sure that everything is okay and in case there is any issues, there are police there to protect. Now we are approaching the first checkpoint. Men and women go into separate areas. This is because everyone gets checked, women need to check their bags, they can't bring in makeup. Women are also not supposed to have makeup on either. Everyone takes off their abaya and everything is checked underneath to make sure that they are not harboring anything illegal or unsafe. Now we are coming up on the second checkpoint. In this one, they actually had a metal detector and an x-ray device to check inside of bags. You can see here, it specifically says women's entrance and the men's entrance is elsewhere. Now I have tried to take you as far as I can so you can kind of see that I'm walking into the entrance here. But when I get past this curtain, that is as far as I can go because out of respect for everyone who is taking off their abaya and hijab sometimes, I do not want to show what's behind the curtain. And just like that, I made it through. I was actually showing a bit of collarbone, so the woman pointed to my collar underneath my abaya and said, you need to make sure that you hide this. And then she started to see some of my tattoos and she was kind of questioning who I was and why I was there. I had to tell her that I did not speak Arabic, so I couldn't really answer her. She responded to me in English and said, oh, foreigner, go ahead. And then I was in. Okay, but now I bet you're wondering, where are you, why are you here, and why is it so strict? I am in the holy city of Najaf, and specifically I am at the shrine of Imam Ali. 
I'll get to that in a moment. Najaf is considered sacred by Shia Muslims. Many people believe that Sunni Muslims are the majority of people in Iraq, but it is actually only about 40%. 55% of the population considers themselves to be Shia Muslim. And Najaf specifically, along with this mosque, is one of the holiest sites in Shia Islam. Now I'm passing through one last checkpoint before I get into the mosque. And I'm in. Immediately I'm greeted by the hustle and bustle with so many people all around in the mosque. Although things are supposed to be separated with men and women, there is also a lot of mixing and people just kind of walking everywhere. But there are specific sides which will become more apparent once we go through these gates. And past these gates is some of the most beautiful mosque architecture I've ever seen. Since this is a shrine, it is believed that Imam Ali was buried here. If you know anything about Islam, or maybe you don't, Muhammad is the prophet and Ali is his cousin and son-in-law. Ali was the first imam, which could be compared to a priest or almost like a pope. So if you can imagine, this is a very big deal and a very important place. Which is why it is covered in gold, there's gate after gate, tons of people around, and a bunch of these men with these green feather dusters cleaning everything. So here I am inside on the women's side. I really just noticed that there were a lot of people praying, but also just hanging out, spending time with their families. It was kind of like a place that people could come and congregate just rest and feel safe. These women here are praying and giving money, and this happens at a few different places, but they're considered holy places, and one of them is the actual tomb of Ali. I knew there had to be more to this mosque because I've seen photos, incredible photos, and finally I saw a glimmer behind this curtain. I don't know if you can see that, but it is blinding and beautiful. I was super excited, and finally when I revealed the curtain, I understood what I had been looking for, and I knew that I found it. Thousands and thousands of mirrors, just glimmering and beautiful. For the next minute or so, I'll just put on a little bit of music, and you can just see the glimmer and all of the beauty, or you can skip ahead. I just took in all of the beauty. I had never seen anything quite like this before. Honestly, it just kept going on and on and on, room after room, one room being even more beautiful than the next, and I guess it made sense that people were throwing money at the different enclosures because they definitely need a lot of money to keep this up. And with that, after spending a few hours here, it was definitely time to go because it was late and of course, I had another very long day ahead of me. Good morning, Baghdad. Today I was on a mission to get somewhere a little bit further where I couldn't have Baghdad be my home base anymore. Said goodbye to Zaid and I jumped in a shared taxi. What are you from? Turkey. Turkey. There was one man here who spoke English and he helped me negotiate the price. Then I sat in the back seat and had absolutely no idea what was going on for a while. 
But hey, I got the price I wanted and I was on my way. Halfway through the trip, we pulled up to a tourist restaurant. No one spoke English, so I'm not really sure what kind of tourist restaurant it was, but maybe it was for local tourists. This is a very typical bathroom in Iraq. You take off your abaya, you hang it up, and there's the toilet. I just figured I would show this because it is something that is very typical in this country. I was hungry, so I tried to order chicken and rice, and this is what came. A lot of food for only about six dollars. Just like that, we continued on for a while. I'm heading to a city called Nasiriya. In order to get into the city walls, you do need to be with a local person or have a local contact. So I went on couch surfing, I met Ali, and he met me at the main checkpoint. I almost forgot I met this Bulgarian woman in a Facebook group online and I told her that she could come with me. So now I'm also with Krasi. We came up to the main checkpoint and because Ali is a doctor, he told me just put on your hijab, act like you're my family, and we'll get through this checkpoint a lot faster. I mentioned his being a doctor because when you flash your doctor ID in Iraq, they really give you a lot of respect. We kept driving and I wanted to point out to you these black flags. These flags help guide pilgrims from Najaf to Karbala. And they actually walk that entire distance. And again, this is for Shia Muslims. But we had arrived to Nasiriya. Now there is a particular reason why you need to have a local contact when going to this city. And that is the high security prison here. Some history on this prison, it was actually built by the United States Army Corps of Engineers. It cost $49 million and it was opened in July 2008. It is actually considered the absolute worst prison in all of Iraq for the mistreatment of their prisoners. And basically all the people here are considered terrorists. For example, there's a hijacker of the Saudi Arabian Airlines flight from 2000 here. People who served as Minister of Defense under Saddam. So although it's not a dangerous city, they're basically just trying to regulate who comes close to this prison. And it's unfortunate because it may be stopping some people from seeing this amazing historical monument that is here. Sigurat of Ur. In Sumerian, the name is Etemeni Guru, meaning the temple whose foundation creates aura. This is a Neo-Sumerian ziggurat built in the early Bronze Age, which was the 21st century BC. Apparently by the 6th century BC, it had crumbled to ruins, which is when King Nabonidus restored it. So it started in the year 2050 BC and then was completed around 2030 BC. However, it was modernly excavated in the 1920s and 1930s. Then in the 1980s, Saddam Hussein decided to encase a partial reconstruction of the facade. It is only one of three well-preserved structures of the Neo-Sumerian city of Ur. Now, I don't totally know this part of the story, but I guess in 2010, during the Iraq occupation, US soldiers did go up to the top of the ziggurat. If anyone knows this history or about this photo, please let me know. But the Sumerians were the earliest known civilization. They are known for innovations in language, governance, architecture, and more. Essentially, they're considered the creators of civilization as we currently understand it. They're also known as the creators of the brick culture because they made a lot of bricks and maybe they were the first to do so. Here you can see the original reeds that were actually used in the foundation of the structure. And then in the Bible, they are referred to as migrants from the east. They are also thought to be assimilated by the Akkadians, a Semitic population. Overall, their civilization flourished between the years of 4100 to 1750 BC. At this point, I was just moving my head back and forth and the wind was only blowing my hair in one area. It was super crazy, but it was definitely time to explore a little bit more. And I decided to head over to what someone told me was a place of worship dedicated to the moon god Nana. And in general, people did not live in the ziggurats themselves, but they believed that gods lived at the very top. So only priests and people of high value could go to the top. This is where it gets really cool. So basically there was someone here and they said, you have to check this out. There is some ancient Sumerian writing here. So I was looking around, searching, and I couldn't find it because he had walked away for a minute until finally I kept exploring and I found it. The fact that there are still these tablets that showcase the writing from literally thousands of years ago is just mind-blowing. You can also just imagine what once all of this was. We kept walking and kept exploring until I came across this sign. And then as I looked in the distance, someone gave me an explanation. This part of the site was found in the early 20th century, where a cylindrical seal in the complex adjacent to the ziggurat bore the name Abraham. It was dated back to 1900 BC, and it is believed that this is the birthplace of Abraham. 
So Abraham was the common Hebrew patriarch of the Abrahamic religions. He is important in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And in all of these religious books, they refer to him that he was called by God to a journey to a new land where he founded a new nation. So religious people believe that Abraham and his wife Sarah lived here and this was his house. Well, it was about that time for us to leave and we were all very hungry. Now at this point, I was still eating chicken, but Ali was actually vegan and that was very inspirational to me because I know that it is very difficult to be vegan in Iraq. We did wear a hijab here just because we didn't want anyone to look at us or say anything to us because we are in a little bit of a more religious area. Unfortunately, I was not wearing the best scarf, so it kept flying up. But I was tired and it was time to go to sleep for a new day. At this point, unfortunately, my iPhone decided to have some trouble. So while I do have some footage from this next part going to Basra, I lost a huge portion of my footage. So I'm going to be showing you a lot of pictures, talking over things, but I'm hoping that you can still understand the story and the general idea of this trip. But to set the scene, I'm on my way to Basra. I jumped in a shared taxi. Before getting to the city of Basra, we had to visit the marshes. And the first thing that someone wanted to do when I arrived was to dress me up in very traditional headdress and I already had this scarf so it worked out perfectly. I was greeted with tea by Ali and his twin brother and then his entire family was there as well including his mother and all of their six children. We chatted for a while and then we saw boats going by. Mesopotamian marshlands are often referred to as the cradle of civilization. Anthropologists actually believe that this is where humankind kind of developed moving from a lifestyle of hunting and gathering to agriculture and settlement. There are tons of birds, shrimp, fish, and there used to be a ton of indigenous people who lived here. However, in the early 1990s, Saddam Hussein decided to destroy the marshes. He bombed them and drained them basically to evict and punish all of the marsh Arabs for uprising against his regime. It is known that the marsh water levels were actually reduced by 90% at this time. Eventually, by 2006, the UN was able to rehydrate and restore everything to 58% of what the original size was. By 2020, around 250,000 marsh Arabs had returned back. So as you can see, at this point, it was kind of at its peak. Buffalo herding is extremely common, and I saw a few farms here as well. Sadly, now in 2024, I guess the situation is actually worse than when Saddam was trying to destroy them because a lot of the water from Iran and the Persian Gulf has been diverted. Anyway, I'm not going to get into that now, but I just thought the history was important. This is Abu Haider. He is a very well-known face in the marsh wetlands, and he took us out on this boat, so we're going to ride around and explore the marshes with him. As I mentioned, I do not have my footage of this, and I'm really sad about that, but I was able to get a few snippets from Ali. If you can see in the distance, we are now coming up on a dome-like structure. This is actually a mosque and a monument for the martyrs and all of the people who died during the draining of the marshes. It is very beautiful inside, it feels a little bit abandoned, but it's definitely a stark difference from what you see in the rest of the marshes. Which are these houses that are made from reeds, and they are very cool inside, but in general I felt super welcomed here and I would love to go back because I had such a wonderful time and I'm very sad that I don't have my memories caught on film. Alas, it was time to say goodbye to Ali and his entire family and this cutie who had warmed up to us. Next stop, Basra for some maskuf. It was actually slightly traumatizing because they have the fish here alive and they'll pull the one out that they want to give you and then they literally kill it in front of you and put it on the spigot. Traumatizing, but tasty. I loved watching them make the bread because they do it in these old style ovens where they take the dough and then they put it on the inside if you can see there and then they pull it out with the tongs and they slap it down and it's so fresh and so yummy. It also comes out as big as your head. I did meet someone on couch surfing so I was hanging out with two men from Basra. We had a lot of food. If you can see we have rice, we have some different herbs, we have dates and pickles. Oh my god, everything was so good. Now we actually did something really cool. There happened to be an art show that was in one of the old houses. And Basra specifically has a special place in my heart because my mother-in-law is from Basra. So I was really excited to be here and experience it. After the main art show, we went to someone's house who had a bunch of antiques and they had basically turned their home into a museum. So there was tons of old Iraqi stuff here. And then at one point, this man decided to play us some old records. <laughs> I'm hoping to not get taken off for Robbie Wright. 
that, we will see. I thought it was really cool to go to this art show and the artist is actually that woman on the right. I loved seeing this other side to Basra and to Iraq. Unfortunately, I was leaving the next morning and I was pretty sad about that because I feel like there's so much that I haven't seen. I haven't been to the north of Iraq at all, which is where a lot of the Kurds live. And that is a whole other situation and story that I would love to get into once I go to that part of the country. But I love Iraq. I am so lucky to be, have been able to travel there. And I hope I will be back again. Thank you, Iraq. If you've made it thus far, it means that you've made it to the Q&A portion. And thank you so much for watching this video. I absolutely love that we can have these discussions from the community posts and then into the videos. So let's get into it. First question. It's a long one, so I'm going to try to kind of summarize it, but I will put it up here as well. Are there children playing on the streets in Iraq? Villages versus cities? Is it different? What do adults do for fun? Do they go to concerts, museums, barbecue? Do you need a VPN to see American movies? How easy is it to buy a smartphone, computer, to get internet? Please talk about the pilgrimage if you want. So thank you so much for this question. There's a lot to get into, so that's why it's a great first question. In general, I felt that this question was asking a lot about do people do the same activities that we do in other countries? Although I too was kind of not sure what to expect when I went to Iraq, I would say that most of the countries in the world are more alike than they are different. Unless there is an active war on the streets, there are always going to be children out. There are always going to be people just going about their daily lives, going to the market, buying fruit, now, I think that a lot of people may have Iraq confused with Iran because a VPN is definitely not needed in Iraq. Um, there's nothing that's banned about American things. So I would say as a whole, if you are comparing, you know, just a regular city or anywhere in Iraq compared to even the USA, it's probably going to be very similar in terms of just people going about their daily lives. As far as children, I think children probably have more freedom in Iraq because in the US, a lot of parents are very much like, huddle mindset and they watch their kids and they don't let them go out but in Iraq I think kids are a little bit more free and they have a little bit more freedom to do things that are more like the old days and again when you talk about do people go on outings other than the mosque I think that is very family dependent right everybody in the world has their own style or their own things that they do so while some people maybe don't do anything besides the market in the mosque just how some people in the US, maybe they only go to church and they only go to the grocery store. But I think for the most part, people have very rich lives in Iraq and there's no need to think that it would be any different than the US because people are not controlled. The government does not have like an active role in, in the lives of people in Iraq. It's a very free country. If you have money, you could buy a smartphone, but it's not something out of the ordinary. Like I said, it's not a controlled society, so everybody has the freedom to do pretty much whatever they want there. Now, let's talk about the Arbaeen pilgrimage because I loved learning about this while I was there. So Arbaeen is actually a bigger pilgrimage than Hajj. A lot of people have really argued about this in the comments, but it is pretty interesting to think about and learn about. So let's talk about it. Well, Arbaeen marks 40 days after Ashura, which is the death anniversary of Hussein Ali. This is known to be the grandson of Prophet Muhammad, and he was the third Shia Imam. So the 40-day period of Ashura is to mourn his death, and there is a pilgrimage that goes from Najaf to Karbala. Now you might remember that I went to that beautiful mosque in Najaf, and most people actually walk this entire distance. It is absolutely crazy to me because I obviously drove it, and it is so far. Now it doesn't actually have to be on the holiday specifically, but most people do. And when they do, there are millions of people. Saddam Hussein actually banned this pilgrimage. So in 2003, when he was overthrown, two million people did this pilgrimage. And then that grew to 20 million in 2014, which is absolute crazy. Think about how many people that is. Now, Hajj, which is the pilgrimage to Mecca, is known as being one of the pillars of Islam. Now, I do not believe that Arbaeen is supposed to be one of the pillars, so I know a lot of people get mad when I talk about it being a pilgrimage. A pilgrimage is literally just defined as a bunch of people doing something together for a religious reason. Arbaeen is specifically for Shia Muslims, so that is also an important thing to mention as well. From what I learned about Arbaeen being more people is that Hajj is extremely expensive, it's hard for people to get to Saudi, so it's not as accessible for people. And that is also supposed to be something that you do once in your life. So for people, that is almost like the epitome of being able to do their pilgrimage, whereas I guess Arbaeen is more accessible for people. 
So that's why more people go to Arbaín, I guess. I'm also just giving all of this information from things that I learned and from things I'm looking up. So obviously, if you have a difference of opinion, feel free to put those in the comments, but I'm just giving my knowledge from what I learned there and what it says online. How strict is the morality police there? What are the feelings of local women towards these rules that are forced on them? This is totally misinformation. Morality police is specifically in Iran. And it's so interesting to me that people confuse Iraq and Iran. And I think it's really important to make videos like this and to talk about it. I have not been to Iran yet. When I go, obviously I will definitely talk about that. But I think it's really interesting that a lot of us in the US or in the West or other countries don't know that that doesn't exist in Iraq. It's not a super conservative country in that way. Similar to any other country, there are people who are more conservative and less conservative. As you may have seen, there is no forced hijab. There is no forced clothing. I mean, there's clubbing in Baghdad and Basra. You can drink alcohol if you want to. The only exception is in these holy cities. Everyone wears hijab. Everyone does not drink alcohol. Everybody follows the Quran very specifically. So that is why I always wore that when I was there out of respect for other people. But there are no laws stating anything. And obviously culturally with families and Middle Eastern culture in general, a lot of time there are certain things that families impose on their children. So when we talk about women, I really can't say that as a whole, but I do know that many women are doctors. All schooling is free in Iraq. So all of the schools, you can go and become a doctor completely for free as long as you get in. Tons of women are doctors. Sadly, those degrees do not translate over to the United States or most countries in Europe, I think in general do have a lot of respect. I know this is not always going to be the case and so that's why I don't want to just generally talk about it like that. So in relation to your question, I would say that is more of a question for someone who visits Iran, not Iraq. And I love that we can talk about this because it's so important to spread this knowledge and for people to know because I think that Iraq has really been demonized by the West. Not that religion is negative. I think people should have a choice whether or not they want to follow a religion. And I think that Iraq gives people that choice. How was the food? Was there a strong street food culture? Love your videos and I'm so inspired by you. Thank you, it's really nice of you to say. As for street food, I don't feel like I had enough street food and I also don't feel like I filmed any of the food basically that I ate, which is so disappointing because Iraqi food was amazing. And obviously I did film this a long time ago, so now I would probably be filming way more and be really excited to share more. The dibis, which is date syrup, was so, so rich. And they have this thing called kaimak. It's called kaimak in Turkish. Not sure what it's called in Arabic, but basically when you have milk, it's like the top fat portion of the milk. So it's this almost buttery, rich, creamy, amazing thing. And you put that on bread and then you put the dibis, the date syrup on top of it. And it's like, so good. So the food was amazing there and I was still eating some chicken back then, especially when I would travel to the Middle East, I was eating chicken. Now you might know I'm pescatarian, I don't eat chicken anymore, but it was good. The shawarma was amazing. If you eat meat, there's a lot of different types of shawarma that you can have and there's also this sauce that I guess is basically just the lamb fat. They mix it with some chili and you can put that on your food and you can dip your bread into it. I wasn't eating the lamb fat at that point either, but it looked really good. And I think you can see that in the scene where I'm having the shawarma. It was so yummy and now I'm getting super hungry thinking about it. I don't know if I mentioned this in the video enough, but I was meeting locals the entire time. So I was going where they wanted to go. I was experiencing their favorite places and I was not gonna argue with that. What was the coolest mosque that you went to? Plus, if you're going back to Iraq, what else would you like to see? Coolest mosque, I would say, was the Imam Ali Shrine. You saw it, it was beautiful. I wish I actually spent more time there. I was just so in awe. It was incredible. And if I were to go back, there's so much that I want to see. Uh, similar to this other question that someone asked, did you visit the Kurdistan region? No, I wish that I visited the north and I'm so sad that I didn't. I had kind of a timeline that I needed to get to a certain place by a certain date. So I only had a week for Iraq and I'm really sad about that because there is a lot more that I wanted to see. For example, Samara, which is about an hour north of Baghdad. And then there are so many places that I wanted to visit in the north. Also, when we were in Najaf, I didn't get a chance to visit the cemetery that's there. The Wadi Al Salam Cemetery is, I think, the largest in Iraq. It's been in use since the 7th century and it's thought to have millions of people. It's supposed to be really incredible to see and I am definitely bummed that I didn't have enough time to go to that. 
Did you meet any Assyrians? I'm Assyrian and my grandma grew up in Nineveh and Baghdad. Just curious. So I did not specifically meet Assyrians in Iraq, but I did in Syria. And if you check out my videos on Syria, I talk all about that. I really enjoyed learning about Assyrian culture. I thought it was really interesting and I would love for you to check out those videos. Are you whispering person in the video for no reason? If you are, may you talk normal level. Okay. I feel that now I am talking at a normal level and this is the same level that I record all of my videos. So today I did this during the day. I try to always do these when I can speak at a normal volume, but let me show you the comparison of whispering this normal talking voice and then I'm gonna yell for you, okay? How, maybe you want me to do this yelling voice. So right now I'm whispering. This would be a whisper voice. I am very quiet. I don't even know if you can hear me because I am whispering so quietly. This is whispering. This is my normal talking voice. I am speaking at a normal volume. I don't feel the need to yell. I think it is totally different from my whispering and I think you can feel the inflection of my voice. You can hear different things. So I don't think I'm whispering, do you? If you want me to yell, I can yell. I can talk very loudly and I can do this and I can be super loud. Let me even take it up one more notch. If you want, I can speak very loudly and I can be like a news reporter or I can scare you like so many YouTube videos do. And hopefully this isn't hurting your ears because I elevate my sound so that it is at a normal volume so that I can just speak in my normal voice so I don't have to yell. Does that answer your question? I hope so. All right, let's get into this one. How do Iraqis view the United States and what do they think of American citizens? When I was visiting, this was now a few years ago, right? So I felt a little worried to say that I was American. So I kind of would hold that back until I had to give that information, but it was never an issue. We definitely discussed a lot of the situation, the war and how that has horrifically affected the country because imagine seeing your country invaded and being treated really horribly by the soldiers. Now, obviously I'm sure every soldier was not a horrible person, but I think they were given a mission and it was not to treat people with respect, sadly. So I definitely think that the locals were treated really poorly, saw things being bombed, saw outside military coming in and just taking over. The American government kind of used Iraq as a way to get things that they wanted. I've only seen a few documentaries. I'm not gonna get into all of that because I have absolutely no idea what is based fully in fact. And I just don't wanna make this video about that. This video is more about the beauty of the country and my amazing time there. But I can completely understand why Iraqis would feel the way they feel about the American government, about the soldiers who came in and how it essentially destroyed their country. And they're still rebuilding from that. If you are pro the Iraqi invasion and you're pro the military going in, I just want you to sit for a minute and think about how you would feel if that were to happen to our country. Imagine France does not agree with our president. They come in and they infiltrate and they put martial law and they kill people. I mean, I can't even imagine how you would react in that case regardless about what you believe of the political situation at the time. So I do think that most Iraqis that I spoke to can understand that it's not all American people. It's just they did not agree with what the government was doing and they hate that government a lot. But no one ever said to me, I hate Americans, which I think is saying a lot. This is an interesting question and I think it's an important one to talk about. How do people see Saddam Hussein? How do the views and customs of the rich and poor differ? I think that this topic is very complex. I have met a lot of people who said they didn't think that Saddam was so bad. And I can understand from a certain perspective because people feel that he did a lot of good for the country. But I think this is very common with dictators and I think it's easy to look past people's very bad faults when they are doing good things for your community. But I don't think that's right. I've heard from people firsthand who were there during his original ruling that he seemed pretty normal at first. He was doing a lot for the people, but if anyone opposed him, then that was it for them. We talk about what happened with the Madan people, the Marsh Arabs. They opposed him, they revolted against him, and he drained the marshes. While some Iraqis do believe that he was a good person and that he was a good support for the country. 
So basically that's it. Some people feel that he was a bad person. Some people feel he was a good person, almost like with any politician. Obviously there are facts and there's a lot of things that went on during that time, but it is interesting to see the different sides. You want to maintain a certain level of respect because a lot of people did pass during his time and it is a very complicated, sensitive issue. But I do think that certain levels of socioeconomic status had to do with support of Saddam or non-support and still to this day. As an Iraqi, you should say how safe our country is just because people saying it's worse than North Korea. I do think it's bizarre the idea that Americans and people in general have about Iraq because it is such an open and free country, has incredible culture. I felt so safe the entire time that I was there, even though I can admit I had preconceived ideas before I went there. I had certain ideas of what I thought the country would be, about what I thought the safety would be. When in the end, I felt like every single person that I met, every single checkpoint, I felt everything was there for my safety. I felt incredibly welcomed and the hospitality was absolutely insane. When I would ask somebody online just for a little bit of help with something or a question, they would literally be like, let me pick you up and take you to my favorite place or let me take you here. Like in the case of Nasiriya, Ali literally came and picked me up when I had just asked him to make a call so he could just be my contact. Just absolute kindness is what was displayed to me the entire time that I was there. Do foreign women have to cover like wear hijab? So I do think I've kind of addressed this, but there is no law stating that anyone needs to cover. No one has to cover. And in Baghdad, I think now pretty much everyone wears something. It is definitely a part of the, the local culture. So no one is forced. You do not have to wear hijab, except if you want to go into certain religious sites. And out of respect, like I said, I wore hijab or I wore chador in certain areas because I didn't want to be sticking out. I didn't want to be disrespectful. But if you want to go into mosques, you need to be properly covered. And that means no hair at all, no makeup. You definitely have to cover if you're going to the mosques because that is just the Islamic law. Iraq being a Shia majority country, do you find any differences with other Sunni Muslim countries that you've traveled to in the past? I would definitely say yes, there are differences in terms of obviously the style of different things with praying and with dress and with holidays. But I think as a country, it's different from other countries based on the local culture. But I wouldn't say that a country for me is different based on the type of religion they follow. It's more based on the actual country itself. So I don't think my experiences have differed because of Shia or Sunni. Maybe the type of mosques that I visit and maybe style of dress, but otherwise, I don't think that has impacted my experience too much. And I think that if we focus on similarities rather than differences, the world would be a better place in general. I wish that we could all just see that we are all human. And that is the only commonality that matters. Okay, thank you so much for all of the questions. I absolutely love doing these parts of the videos as I always tell you. Thank you for watching. Let me know any more questions down below and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.